Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, we have been making our way through this gospel chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And we come this morning to the final section of this chapter. Jesus has been talking about the nature of the kingdom since about verse 18. That has been the theme. He has been talking about how to get into this kingdom. He has been revealing as well as to who will be excluded from this kingdom. And then with that, of course, who will be included into this kingdom. And so we come to a scene this morning in which Jesus will now reveal his own personal commitment to bringing this kingdom into fruition. That is to say that we'll see here his conviction to the plan of the Father, and also we'll see his motive behind his conviction. Just a wonderful insight, frankly, into the heart of our Lord in this passage. And so before we get into it, let me just simply read the words for us just to get them fixed into our minds, and then we'll take a closer look at the text itself. And so again, we are in chapter 13, and we will be in verses 31 through 36 for this morning. Here's what Luke records under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, verse 31. And just at that time, some Pharisees approached, saying to him, Go away, leave here, for Herod desires to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox... Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I reach my goal. Nevertheless, I must journey on today and tomorrow and the next day, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her, how often I desired and willed to gather your children together, just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not have it. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. And I say to you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, as we've been making our way through this gospel, we have seen now many things in 13 chapters concerning the person of Christ. We have seen his work. We have seen his nature. Of course, we have seen his person. But something that has been somewhat rare, somewhat hidden, you could say, is any real insight into the sort of inner life of Jesus, insight into his burdens, insight into his emotions. We see not much recorded regarding his private thoughts. We see not much recorded regarding his personal prayers. Saw a little bit of that back in chapter 10, in which we were brought into one of his prayers, just briefly, between him and the Father. But other than that, we have seen very little and so this becomes a passage this morning that stands out as somewhat rare, not only in the Gospel of Luke, but in the Gospel records as a whole. And because what we get here are a couple of points at which Luke will now seek to draw us, but into the very heart of Jesus. We see here not only what drives him and compels him to be faithful to the task that has been given to him by the Father, but we also see here what moves him. That is to say, what grips his heart, what keeps him faithful, what shapes his own convictions in terms of the mandate that has been placed upon his life and his ministry by his own father. And so with that being the case, this passage then becomes not merely a rare insight into the inner motives and the inner life of our Lord, but it does in a sense then become instructive for us as well in the purposes of God through Luke. That is to say that this gives to us a model, it gives to us an example to follow in terms of what it is that ought to drive us as well, what it is that ought to shape our own motives and our convictions in terms of the fact that we have been given a ministry by the Father as well. The outward life of any person is always the result of what is in the heart. What the outward life produces is a direct product of that which abides within the inner man. And so we'll get here just a glimpse into what it is that is in the heart of Christ himself. Again, this is what moves him. This is what drives him. And so these will become the very things then that ought to drive us as well. And so with that, I have just two points for us this morning, two very simple points. In verses 31 through 33, we're going to see, first of all, the conviction of Christ. 31 through 33, we will see the conviction of Christ. And then in 34 and 35, we will see the compassion of Christ. The compassion of Christ. So the conviction of Christ and then the compassion of Christ. 
And so as one person put it to me, this sermon will apparently be brought to you this morning by the letter C. But just two very simple points for us this morning. This is not a complex text, very simple, very straightforward. But again, it is important because it establishes for us the kinds of thoughts and motives that kept Christ faithful himself, but all the way until the end. And so these are the things that ought to keep us faithful as well. And so let us take a look then at the first point starting here in verse 31. Notice again what Luke records. He says, And just at that time some Pharisees approached, saying to him, Go away, leave here, for Herod desires to kill you. Now, what we have here in verse 31 is the setting of this passage. And so let me just try and build out the context a little bit for us. First of all, notice Luke begins here by saying that at that time, or literally in that hour, which, of course, is a phrase that functions to sort of connect this passage to that which is previous, And so again, there's been a singular theme going all the way back to about verse 18, and that has been Jesus' teaching on the nature of his kingdom. And so this phrase here helps us to understand that these verses are still connected to that very important theme. Now, at this point in the flow of the narrative of Luke's gospel, Jesus is in a place called Perea. Remember, we're in the middle of something called the travel narrative, which runs from chapter 9 through chapter 19. And Jesus is now in a place called Perea. And remember, he's been zigzagging his way toward Jerusalem. You see that in verse 22. He is now on a mission to get himself onto the cross so that he might die and pay for the sins of his own people and therefore purchase for himself citizens for this kingdom. But all along the way, he's been going from town to town and village to village, teaching on the nature of his kingdom. And so in verse 31, Luke states that some of these Pharisees come to him, and notice, they warn him to leave. And why? Well, because evidently Herod now desires to kill him. Now, first of all, there's a lot of speculation on this as to why these Pharisees would do this, a lot of debate and discussion in the commentaries. It is a bit suspicious, just given their hatred for Jesus up until this point, But the truth is, is that Luke here just doesn't tell us, whatever the reason might be. And so let me just save a lot lot of time here by saying that we don't know because we can't know. Luke does not tell us, and so no matter how much we desire to speculate on that, it is, at the end of the day, mere speculation. And so the fact that Luke doesn't tell us means then that that is not the point. That is not his concern. That is not his burden in this text. And so what is the point? Well, the point is, notice, Jesus' response to these Pharisees, and because that is what Luke records for us. And so in verse 32, Jesus, notice, gives the response. And notice what he says. Luke states in verse 32, Jesus said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I reach my goal. Now, Herod, of course, becomes the issue here. He is the player in this passage. And if you remember, Herod was the regional authority here that was contracted by Rome to sort of rule in this territory, in this particular region. This is Herod Antipas, also known to us as Herod the Tetrarch, not to be confused, of course, with Herod the Great, who is his father. Herod the Great is the one who killed all the little babies back in Matthew chapter 2. Herod the Great was a vile man. He's the one who gave himself the title Herod the Great. Very prideful, very full of himself. And I don't have the time to give us here a history of the what's called the Herodian dynasty. I did that back in chapter 3 if you're interested or you want a refresher and are bored one day. But again, this is Herod the Tetrarch or Herod Antipas. This is the son of Herod the Great ruled from about 4 A.D. to 37 A.D. He is wicked. He was paranoid. He was a pawn of Rome. And yet what is important to observe is that Jesus stands here as utterly unimpressed. And so notice again verse 32. Jesus actually begins by calling him a fox. He says, go and tell that fox. Now, let me say here that this is the only time that you will see Jesus call somebody a name. A lot of people like to take this verse as license to start calling people out, to start sort of publicly mocking people, especially public and secular rulers. Jesus did it, therefore I can do it. But there is a very specific reason that Jesus does this, and that is that, notice, he wants to heighten the 
drama over the fact that he knows exactly how it is that he himself is going to die. That is why he does this. Now, Herod, of course, will eventually come to conspire for the death of Jesus with Pontius Pilate. He will do it along with some of the Jews, according to Acts chapter 4. And so part of why Jesus does this may be that he simply wants at this point to provoke this man. Remember, Jesus does need to get up onto the cross somehow, and so he needs these political pawns in the hands of Satan to be activated somehow. And so perhaps he's simply wanting to provoke him here because he is drawing nearer to the time of the cross. But whatever the case, at this point in the flow of the narrative, Jesus knows exactly how he is going to die, and he knows that he is not going to die by the hands of Herod in Perea. This is the point. In fact, notice verse 33. He says that this is something that's going to happen, but in Jerusalem. That is to say that he knows the plan. He knows that he must be killed, but he also knows that it will not be now. There are still many things for him to accomplish before his death. And so with great boldness, he refers to Herod here with a mocking term. Now, he calls him a fox, which is, I suppose, somewhat strange to our ears. Doesn't sound much like an insult to us. We like foxes. In fact, I have one in my neighborhood, and every time we see it, we get all excited. We're a very interesting family. Foxes generally are graceful. They're quiet. They're quick. They're intentional. They do not like to be seen. They are usually pretty in color. And so when you spot one, it is, I guess, somewhat exciting. But in this day, to be called a fox, especially when in a position of leadership, was to be insulted in a very great way because it was a statement actually of great contempt, a statement of disdain or disapproval for a person's performance. And because foxes are also known for being somewhat wily, right? They are cunning, they are sneaky, they can be destructive. In fact, Solomon will even talk about them as running through the vineyards and destroying the fields in Song of Solomon chapter 2. In fact, when it came to the category of a ruler in this day, there was a very well-known contrast between calling somebody a fox and then referring to somebody as a lion. Either you were a noble and powerful and upright and bold and protective leader who brought stability and progress to a people, or you were a conniving, sort of backdoor-dealing, bottom-feeding nuisance who was rather destructive, shady, shifty, petty. And there is no question historically that all of that was true of Herod Antipas, all of those things he certainly was. But the identification of Fox here also indicates that while Herod may have been a nuisance, he was also at the same time posing no real threat to Jesus. In fact, just as a fox is unable in any real way to hunt down and kill a man, in contrast to maybe a lion, so Herod here couldn't actually kill the person of Jesus. That is more so the point of the term in the context. And so again, Jesus knew this. He understood this, which is why he calls him this. Herod was powerless in terms of the divine plan. Jesus knew his purpose. He knew his task. And so he knew that he still needed to accomplish many things. And so as a result, he knew his end. That is to say, again, that he knew exactly how he was going to die, and it wouldn't be by this man and in this place. In fact, notice again verse 32. He says, So go and tell him, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I reach my goal. And so, again, this is to say that Jesus knew that Herod, frankly, wasn't going to do anything. He says, I'm just going to keep doing what I've always done, and I will do it precisely because Herod is no threat. I will keep casting out demons. I will perform cures. I will keep teaching. I will go at my pace, and I will accomplish everything that I intend to do, and Herod will not cause even the slightest interruption. That is the sense of the verse. And so I'm just going to keep doing what I've always done, but until I'm finished. Now, this statement here on the third day, we see third day and we immediately think of the resurrection, but that is not the meaning here. This is simply a Hebraism or just a Hebrew way of saying something. And the sense of the phrase here is to say that this is going to happen, but not long from now. Jesus says that I'm going to just keep doing what I've been doing, and then on the third day or just not long from now, I will have completed exactly what I desire to complete. 
There will be no interruptions. There will be no obstacles. Only a perfect execution of my plan, but exactly as I intend for it to be accomplished. In other words, what is verse 32? Well, verse 32 is really nothing more than Jesus just blowing off the Pharisees. He is blowing off Herod. He is blowing off the authorities. And why? Well, because there is something in much greater authority here. This is the point. There is the conniving plan of Herod, but then there is the immovable plan of a sovereign God. And there are many implications to this that we don't have the time here really to talk about, there, but there are many things that could be said here in terms of living the Christian life, but from a place of fear, making decisions from fear and safety and not trusting in the purposes of God, especially when it comes to things like secular authorities or external threats. There are so many things that we'll often do from a place of fear that we might even call wisdom, but that do not have the purposes of our God in mind. But I like what George Woodfield once said. He said that we are immortal until our work for the divine is accomplished. That is just a great biblical truth. You are immortal until your work in the divine purposes of God is complete. That is to say that you are, in a sense, untouchable. In other words, God already has a plan and purpose for his church. God has a plan and purpose for this church. God has a plan and purpose for your life if you're in Christ. And because you are what make up this church, you are what make up the church. And he has, in his purposes, called us to certain things. He has written out a plan for our lives before the ages even began. And all of his purposes, understand from a biblical perspective, have been utterly fixed. They are unmovable, unchangeable. They are uninterruptible. In fact, it's kind of like what Job said in Job 42 and verse 2, and he said that I know that you, God, can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Not only does God have a plan and a purpose for every single detail in the universe, from things like roving planets all the way down to the smallest of quarks, but he also has the power and the ability to execute all of his purposes and in his perfect timing. Isaiah chapter 46 and verse 10 says this, The prophet writes that you, O God, have declared the end from the beginning, which, of course, implies everything in between. But you have declared the end from the beginning, from ancient times, these things which have not yet been done, saying, My purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Here the fixed certainty in those statements. Whatever God intends to happen will always come to pass and in His timing, without fail. These are things which God has planned from ancient times, He says, which have not yet been done or accomplished, and yet God intends to accomplish all of His good pleasure. Key word being all. That is what it means to be an omnipotent, sovereign God of the universe. Not only do you possess the right, but you possess the power to do so. And so when Paul says something like he does to the church, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, when he says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, for what purpose? For good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we walk in them. What is that saying? Well, that is saying that it is not possible, therefore, not to walk in them. It is not possible not to walk in them. And why? Well, because God has prepared this beforehand. And Isaiah 42, 2 says that anything that God has prepared and desires to bring about will always come to pass every single time. And that is the truth that Jesus here, I believe, is tapping into when he speaks with such certainty, such boldness. He does not fear. He does not compromise. Rather, he stays utterly fixed. He is committed to the task that has been entrusted to him. He has some ministry to accomplish here still in Perea, and he will not leave until it is finished. And that, by the way, is the essence of faithfulness. It is the carrying out of God's purposes, but often in the midst of opposition. In fact, the word faith in the Greek is the word pistuo. It is a word that at its core means simply to trust. And so what is faithfulness? Well, faithfulness is entrusting yourself to God, but in the midst of opposition, in the face of hardship, in the face of threat, or what looks like to be an insurmountable task or obstacle. 
And yet in the face of the threat, there are so many who will so often simply compromise from a place of fear in the Christian life. But Jesus here becomes our great model. Notice he does not fear. He does not flinch. Which, by the way, is also to say, and this is the implication here, but he does not flinch. But precisely because he has got some convictions about certain truth. That is to say that he knows the plan. He knows the power of God. He knows what he is supposed to be doing. And so he has developed a conviction of that truth. He knows exactly how the Messiah is supposed to be killed. And based upon Old Testament, which is to say that he knows, in a sense, the word of God. He knows that this would not be happening by Herod in Perea. In fact, the separation between one who merely knows the truth of God's word and merely says with their mouth that they believe the truth, and then the one who actually does the truth is always the one who has developed a conviction of the truth. Knowledge and conviction are two very different things. The difference between mere knowledge and then conviction is often the difference between faithfulness and unfaithfulness. What is conviction? Conviction is what happens when truth in the head becomes settled within the heart. It is no longer up in the air. It is no longer a discussion. It is no longer something over which you waver. Rather, it is firm. It is established. It is that controlling mechanism within your own soul. And the exposure between the one who merely knows the truth and the one who's got a conviction of the truth is almost never seen until a person is in the midst of some kind of threat, until the opposition comes, until fear comes, even at times until certain temptation will come. The one who compromises in the midst of fear or temptation is the one who knows the truth but has not yet developed a conviction over that which they know, over that which they say that they believe. In fact, it is amazing to me how many will say that they love Christ, they'll say they love His Word, they'll say that they love God, they love His Gospel. But then when things start to go bad or things get confusing or some fearful things begin to rear their ugly head, they all of a sudden get to begin to become a bit squirmy, right? They're not fixed. They're not stable. They become tossed to and fro by every new thing or every new unknown that comes flying into their life. They begin to doubt. They begin to second guess, they don't know what to do, or they become tempted to do that which they know they ought not to do. And why? Well, because in claiming to know the truth of God's Word, they've never developed a conviction of that Word. It's never become settled within their heart and come to control them. This is true whether you're talking about something in your marriage, something with your kids, how you parent, something at work, something in your own vocation, something related to government. Once the pressure comes or once the fearful thoughts begin to creep in, the question is, what will you actually do? What will you do? And what you do will always expose for you whether you're merely knowing the truth or you've developed a settled conviction of the truth. Everybody has a great faith when there is no opposition, right? Everyone's got a great faith when there is no threat, when there is no temptation, when there is no trial to test. But the example of our Lord here is that not only does He know the Word, but He also lives and dies by the Word, literally. And why? Well, because in understanding the truth of God, the truth is what has come to control Him. He knew God's word. He knew God's purposes. And so in the face of threat, he did not flinch. In fact, notice again, when the threat came, he simply resolved to just keep doing exactly what he had come to do. Just do the same thing that he's been doing. And why? Well, because no mere human could ever thwart the predetermined purposes of God. No matter how much 
power they might have from an earthly perspective. The Messiah was to be executed, but he was to be executed in Jerusalem. In fact, notice verse 33. We see a very important word. He says, nevertheless, I must, circle that word, but I must journey on today and tomorrow and the next day. Why? For it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. Now, the word must here, as we've seen now a number of times in the gospel, is the word day, D-E-I in the Greek. It is a term that speaks of necessity, speaks of prophetic necessity, prophetic fulfillment. In fact, I refer to it often as the divine must. In fact, we saw this back in chapter 2 in verse 49 when Jesus was in the temple as a 12-year-old boy. You might remember this. His parents left Jerusalem after Passover week. Jesus stays behind. They come back. They're pretty upset. They're angry. They question him. What does Jesus say to them? Chapter 2, verse 49, he said, And why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? So again, he had a task, he had a purpose. There was a divine mandate upon his life that could not be fulfilled. We saw most explicitly in chapter 9 and verse 22, chapter 9 and verse 22, Jesus there is with his disciples and begins to question them. He asks, starting in verse 18, who do the people say that I am? Verse 19, they answered, they said, John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Others that one of the prophets of old has risen again. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said that you are the Christ of God. But he warned them and instructed them not to tell this to anyone, saying that the Son of Man must suffer. There's the term divine necessity. This is how it must happen. This is how it will happen. So he's already got a conviction of this starting back in chapter 9. But the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. In other words, again, this was a prophetic necessity. And why? Well, because this is something that has already been established and predetermined by God himself. This was the predetermined purpose of God and therefore could not come to pass. In fact, that is exactly what the people confirm then in Acts chapter 4 and verse 27, Acts 4 and verse 27, when they say, for truly in this city, Jerusalem, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod, so there's Herod, but notice this time in Jerusalem, but Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And so again, going back to chapter 13 of Luke, Jesus knew exactly how this was going to go down, and so he did not fear. He did not fear. And so what is the point? Well, the point is that he had a conviction of the truth. He knew what God had said. He knew how this must happen. And so again, back in chapter 13 and verse 33, he says, So I must, there's the term, divine necessity, but I must journey on today and tomorrow and the next day, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. In other words, not only must this happen, but he also says that this must happen in a very specific way. In fact, he says, notice that the prophets of God were always killed in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, of course, is the capital city of Israel. It is the symbol of everything that is supposed to represent God. And especially to the world, it's where the temple was, it's where the sacrifices were made, it is where God dwelled with his people in a unique way within the Holy of Holies, within the temple. And so all throughout the history of Israel, God would send forth his prophets to cry out repentance in the streets of Jerusalem, but what did they do? They would just kill them. They would not have it. That is the story of the Old Testament. God would send in his prophets to disobedient Israel, but they would just slaughter them. They would not accept God's word. They would reject, reject his word through his prophet, and they would not turn and repent at the word of God. They were rebellious, stiff-necked. They loved their idols. They loved to chase after foreign gods. By the time we get to the Gospels in the New Testament, they're in love with their religious system, their apostate system of Judaism, believing that that was the path to God. And so they thought all was well. They thought they were holy. They thought they were in the kingdom. 
And so Jesus being the greatest of all prophets, and of course the one to whom all other Old Testament prophets pointed, and of course one who came preaching the message of repentance, and a long line of prophets who preached the message of repentance, that is what would get him killed. In fact, in many ways, that is the mark of an authentic prophet. The only way that a sinful, rebellious people would kill you is if you say things to them that they don't like. You call out their sin, their hypocrisy. You call out their rebellion, their wretchedness. And of course, all of that is exactly what Jesus did. And so we have here in verses 31 through 33 the conviction of Christ to the predetermined and sovereign purposes of God to establish his kingdom. And again, how is this going to happen? Well, through his sufferings and crucifixion. And so in the face of this particular threat, he is unmoved, unflinching. He is utterly fixed to carry out the mandate upon his life to head toward Jerusalem to initiate this kingdom. This is a picture of faithfulness to the Word of God, but because of a conviction. It was settled in his heart, and therefore that is what controlled him. And of course, there's much more we could say on this. There are many implications and inferences for our lives as well, but we've got to keep moving. But that is the conviction of Christ, the conviction of Christ. But then second of all, notice we come then in verses 34 to the compassion of Christ, the compassion of Christ. Notice what he says here in verse 34. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her, how often I will to gather your children together. Just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you would not have it. Now, even with just a quick read here, you can almost feel the burden that he has for this nation. Because I thought about this, I thought about how easy it is at times for us to just sort of write people off, right? You give the gospel to somebody and then they reject it, and so you just sort of coldly write them off. We'll even wonder at times, how many times must I keep bringing the gospel? How many times must I plead with the person to see their sin and to know their sin and to understand their need to be forgiven? How many times must I bring the gospel to that same person who just keeps rejecting and because they are so blind to the truth of what they are? Well, in many ways, it is that very hardness of the sinner that motivates Jesus. It is the hardness of people that creates within him those compassion. In fact, you see that here in the doubling of the terms. As I pointed out to you before, the doubling of the terms implies always a sense of intimacy, a sense of, of care. There's even a certain intensity here with this, a certain emotional burden of the soul. It's kind of like what we see with David. In 2 Samuel 18, when he hears of his son Absalom's death, and he says in verse 33 of 2 Samuel 18, he says, Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom. We see it as well with Jesus in Luke chapter 10 when he says to Martha, Martha, Martha. Or in chapter 22 in verse 3, Oh, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. See it as well in Acts 9, verse 4, when he appears to Paul in that great vision. And he says to them, him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And so again, the doubling of the terms signifies intimacy, personal knowledge, a burden. And so in verse 34 here, notice there's a level of emotional burden that is coming from a place of great concern. You could even say there's a certain duress of the soul, certain compassion and this is what compels him in his mission to get to the cross for this nation. In fact, notice the concern. Notice what he says in verse 34. He says, How often I willed to gather your children together just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not have it. Now, that is not something that you would say of an enemy, right? That is not a person's perspective of somebody that they're indifferent toward. In fact, the imagery here of a hen gathering her brood, it's, it's actually an image that harkens back to the imagery of the Old Testament with regard to God for his people. And so in Ruth chapter 2 and verse 12, for example, Boaz says to Ruth, 
He says, may the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. And so this is an image of protection, an image of care, safety, shelter. Psalm 17 and verse 8, David as king cries out in his prayer and says, Oh, keep me as the apple of the eye and hide me in the shadow of your wings. So again, protection, refuge, deliverance. There are many of these in the Old Testament, but Psalm 57, when David is fleeing from Saul, who is seeking to execute him, David there remembers hiding in the darkness and the blackness of a cave, and he pens this psalm, and he begins in verse 1 with this cry of the heart. He says, So be gracious to me, O God, be gracious to me, for my soul takes refuge in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will take refuge until destruction passes by. And so again, just a vivid Old Testament metaphor of the safety and deliverance and protection of God speaks even of salvation. And what's important to understand about this is that this is a description that is always applied to God alone. And so when Jesus here says, oh, how I long to gather you under my wings, understand that that then is actually a statement that is flowing from his own deity. That is a statement of care and burden that only God could make for his people. And so Jesus here, notice, is not the one seeking safety, certainly not from somebody like Herod. Rather, he himself is God who has come to bring safety. He has come to provide refuge and deliverance from sin and Satan and death, those three great enemies. And of course, all of which would be accomplished on the cross. In fact, again, that is why he must get to the cross. It's not just that he needs to be faithful to the word of, of God. That, that is certainly implied. But most importantly, it is because he himself is God, and he is the very one who brings to his people deliverance. He is the one who accomplishes salvation for the sinner, but in the cross, he must die for the sinner in their place as their substitute. The wages of sin is death. And so if salvation is to happen for the sinner, then somebody's got to die. And so Jesus comes as Israel's deliverer. He came to bring deliverance, and yet, as he says, they would not have it. They want a deliverance from Rome, but he has come to bring a much more important and permanent deliverance that they did not want. In fact, notice the end of verse 34. They need desperately a rescuer. They need to be delivered. The rescuer has come, but they would not have him. In fact, that final phrase in verse 34 of have it, they would not have it, is notice italicized if you have the New American Standard, which means then that it's not actually in the original. Remember, when you have an italicized word in the New American Standard, at least, that is not italicized for the sake of emphasis. Rather, that is indicating that it is not actually part of the original. And so the statement then is actually much more definitive. And so it's literally, and how often I willed to gather your children together, just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not, full stop. He says you would not. You would not accept the protection. You would not the deliverance, you would not the salvation, you would not the blessings and entrance and forgiveness, all of which comes with the kingdom. And the point to understand with this is that this is not Jesus speaking from anger. That is not what is happening here. Rather, this is Jesus looking at a rejecting nation and expressing from the soul a deep and compassionate burden. This is pity for them. He is not offended by their rejection. Rather, he has pity for them. We get offended by people's rejection. Wrong response. This is the burden of a God for his people. There is a sorrow within the heart. In fact, it is a burden that stems from what John says in John chapter 1 and verse 11 when he says that he, Jesus, came to his own, talking about the Jews, but he came to his own, but those who were his own did not receive him. That is to say, again, that they would not. And so the life and the ministry of Jesus, frankly, was a ministry of rejection. Time and time again, all they did was reject him. And what is so compelling is that even in the midst of such rejection, 
and such hostility, even such hatred. His face is still resolutely set toward Jerusalem. Chapter 9 and verse 51. That is again to say that his commitment was settled, his conviction was fixed, and it flowed, frankly, from his compassion for a rebellious people. A wicked people. And again, his compassion, understand, is something that was informed by the Word of God. It was a compassion that flowed from understanding the word, and that Israel was indeed the covenant people of God, and that he himself was the Messiah that had been sent to deliver them. In fact, if you want to know the secret to faithfulness in ministry, it is nothing more, but at the same time, nothing less than developing a conviction, but from the word of God alone. If your motive for ministry is fueled by loyalty from people or just some social thing or because you're trying to build something, you're never going to survive. That's why the average pastoral tenure, by the way, is two to three years. They grow weary. They burn out. They get bitter. And that is something that is true with any Christian in any area of the Christian life, whether, again, it's your marriage, your children, vocation, how you view and serve your own church perhaps. Faithfulness in life and faithfulness to your calling comes by a conviction to be faithful to the task and the mandate that has been given to you, but through the Word of God alone. There's a mandate upon your life. Your commitment is to the Word because God has placed some things upon you. In fact, that phrase there at the end of verse 32 of, notice, I reach my goal, that is the verb teleao. Teleao, which, which literally means to finish, to complete, to fulfill. In fact, it's the exact same verb that Jesus cries out from the cross when he says that it is finished. He had a mission, he had a goal. He had a ministry placed upon him by the Father to complete, and he would not finish until it was done. And so in the midst of rejection, he could still persevere. He kept the course. He journeyed to Jerusalem. He made his way to the cross. And then on that cross, he died for the very sins of the people that put him there. And again, why? How could he do that in the midst of such hostility? How can he be faithful in hostility? Well, again, there, there were many reasons. And again, the main one here being a conviction to his calling, verse 33. But the reason that Luke gives here in verses 34 and 35 is, notice, it is his own compassion for the covenant people of God. He looks upon this wicked nation, and instead of abandoning them, he actually commits himself all the more to go to the cross and die for them. He laid down his life for the ones who opposed him. In fact, remember, at this point, he is still making his way to the city, and he will continue to do so all the way until chapter 19 in this thing called the travel narrative. And so in chapter 19, there's a very dramatic moment in which Jesus finally reaches the city. And just before he's about to enter it on Passion Week, he looks over the city from a distance, and he begins to weep. Chapter 19 and verse 41. And when he, Jesus, approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it. Is that how you feel about the ones who oppose you? He wept over it. Verse 42, saying, If you, Jerusalem, had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. What is that saying? He is saying it is too late. It is too late. There is now an active hiding of the truth. And so what is the result? Verse 43, And so the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and they will level you to the ground and your children within you, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another. And why? Here is the reason. Because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. What is he saying? He is saying that I have come. 
I have come to you. I am the Messiah who has visited you. And when I called for you to recognize me for who I am, you would not. You would not receive me. What is the result? The judgment of God will come upon you. And by the way, that is something that is still true even to this day. Enemies constantly surround the nation of Israel as a result of God's judgment upon them. Even to this day, the nation of Israel still does not recognize her Messiah as atrocious as something like the Holocaust was. There's a reason for that. As atrocious as what happened just three weeks ago and is still happening, there is a reason for that. In fact, that statement there in chapter 19 is actually a prophecy that would come true just 35 years later, beginning in 66 A.D. and finishing in 73 A.D., in which the Romans under the emperor Titus would come in and demolish the city to the ground in one of the most brutal invasions, frankly, that this world has ever seen. 1.1 million Jews are slaughtered, 97,000 are sold into slavery. 70 A.D., their great temple is destroyed, leaving literally not a single stone upon another, and just as Jesus said would happen. And so what has become their state? Well, they were left desolate. They were left desolate. In fact, notice verse 35 of Luke 13. This is exactly what Jesus said would happen. He says, And behold, your house is left to you, Desolate, And notice again here, the word desolate is italicized as well, so it's not actually in the original. And so it's literally, and behold, your house is left to you. Your house is left to you. And that, by the way, is a very dramatic statement. Very dramatic. What makes it dramatic? Well, because at this point, understand, it is then no longer God's house. He says that, notice, this is now your house. That is to say, like in the book of 1 Samuel, when it says Ichabod, literally the glory has departed from you, from the temple. God was not with his people. They had rebelled. They had rejected. They had looked to themselves, their own religion, their own desires. And then even... In the midst of that rebellion, what would God do? He'd still send them their Messiah, right? And so what is verse 35? Well, verse 35 then becomes a statement of judgment because in sending the Messiah, they would not. This is a statement of profound judgment. In fact, what you have here is a statement of wrath. This is like the wrath of Romans chapter 1. In fact, turn there with me if you can quickly. I just want to illustrate this for you a little bit. Romans chapter 1, Paul here is speaking of the wrath of God, but it's a very specific kind of wrath. There are, if you didn't know, different forms of God's wrath in the Bible. And so in Romans chapter 1, we have what some theologians refer to as God's wrath of abandonment. God's wrath of abandonment. This is Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. Notice here how Paul begins. He says, For the wrath of God, so that is the theme of this passage, that is the controlling concept, the wrath of God, and the term wrath, understand, is a judicial term. It's not just like an uncontrolled or unhinged sense of rage or something like that. Rather, it's a judicial term. But the wrath of God is revealed, present tense, from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Why? Because that which is known about God is evident. Where? Within them. How? For God made it evident to them. How? Verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen. So not sort of, not kind of. Clearly seen. How? Being understood through what has been made. What is the result? They are without excuse. In other words, you see a creation, you should know instinctively that there is a what? A creator, that simple. 
For that reason, there will be no excuse. No one will be able to plead ignorance in that day. Verse 21, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God nor give to him thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And that, by the way, is our age. So many believe in themselves to be wise, believe in themselves to know something. They speak with such confidence, such arrogance, such pride. They give to themselves PhDs. Adorn themselves in robes. They think they know better in this over-educated society in which so many profess wisdom. But professing to be wise, they become fools. Verse 23, and exchange the glory of God for the incorruptible God, for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and of crawling creatures. In other words, they just begin to worship the creation rather than the creator. Verse 24, therefore, so here it is. Here's the wrath of God and the abandonment sense being played out. So therefore, what happens? God gave them over. He gave them over. And to what? Well, to the lusts or desires of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. And then he goes on to give an example of what that is. In other words, there is a sense in which the wrath of God is seen when he just gives a person, person or even a nation over to that which they're most loving. Their own lusts, their own pursuits, their own desires. The things that they worship within their own hearts. In fact, so many will say when it comes to an issue in their own life, well, God has to be okay with this, it, it seems, and I think, because things just seem to be working out. It feels good. It feels right. Things are happening. Things are lining up. Things just seem to keep falling into place for me. Well, perhaps that is not God actually blessing you. Perhaps that is God giving you over. And that is exactly what happened to the nation of Israel. This is exactly what Jesus is saying would happen. He says in verse 35, notice, And behold, your house, catch that word, your house has been left to you. God says, this is what you want. Here you go. Your house, not mine, your house now, because I am gone. And that, by the way, is one of the most frightening things that could ever happen to a person. Living under the veritable delusion that God is with them, but in reality, he's just given them over. And so Jesus weeps for the nation in chapter 19, but because he knows that God has given them over. The nation wanted to be the hub of military power. That, that is what drove it. That is what they lusted for. They wanted back their land. They wanted their freedom back from Rome. So what did God do? He left them to their own. He said, you want military power? Fine, then pursue it. See what happens. They were more in love with keeping their land than they were with the God who gave to them their land. And so in 66 AD, Rome comes in and begins a siege work against the Jewish uprising in which they sought to revolt against Rome. Over a million Jews are slaughtered, thousands thrown into captivity. The city is leveled, temple destroyed, the rest are dispersed, people are scattered, and the land that they lusted for is most definitely not theirs. They did not trust God, but trusted in their own power. And for roughly 2,000 years, that has been their history. This was a statement of judgment by Jesus, and it has absolutely come to pass. But here's what I want us to know. At end of verse 35, there is, in this verse, a double declaration. So notice, he gives a statement of judgment, but then he ends with a statement of hope. This is a word of promise. So he says in verse 35, Behold, your house is left to you, and I say to you, you will not see me until, keyword. 
but you will not see me until the time comes when you, Jerusalem, say, blessed is he, that's a reference to Christ, but blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What is that? Well, that is a statement, hear this, of future blessing. That is a statement of future blessing. The object of this statement in this text, understand, make no mistake, is Jerusalem, which stands in as Israel itself. And so after all the rejection and all the rebellion, is God done with Israel? Well, by the words of Jesus himself, absolutely not. This is a statement in which Jesus declares that there will be a day in which Israel will come, hear this, to recognize her Messiah. It's not happened for 2,000 years, certainly not happening today. In fact, they're still fighting for their own and in their own power, literally as we speak, as all sides are coming in on them. But a day is coming in which they will see Christ and recognize Him for who He is. Very important text, Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10 says this, Zechariah 12, 10, it says, and I, God, hear this, will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. For what purpose? So that they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. And in that day there will be a great mourning where? In Jerusalem. He weeps for them, but one day they will weep for him. Confirmed again in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, talking about the return of Christ. John writes, And behold, he, Jesus, is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, so it is to be. Key word in verse 35 of Luke is his word of until. It is a preposition of time. You will not see me, you will not recognize me until... God has given Israel over for a time, and they have suffered the consequences of their own rejection, but there is a day coming in which they will come to see Jesus as the Christ. Matthew chapter 24, he'll return upon the Mount of Olives, establish his kingdom. And then in that day, as Jesus says, God will take back up residence within the house of Israel, and they will be blessed. They will be blessed. And will they be blessed just because Jesus comes back? No. Rather, they'll be blessed, and hear this, but they'll be blessed because Jesus has come back. But the implication is that they have looked upon him and repented. They will have repented. That is to say, again, that they will have come to see that Jesus was indeed their Messiah. And there's so much here that we could get into regarding Israel. God has made some promises, and he is not done with them. In fact, Paul says that right now there is a partial hardening that hap has happened to Israel until, keyword, until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, which is you and me, the church. Romans chapter 11 and verse 25. And so in the meantime, the Gentiles, which again are you and me, that is non-Jews, have been grafted into this tree of promise. We are not natural branches. We are not Jews that I'm aware of. But we are grafted in. But one day when Christ returns, then in that day Israel will come to receive Jesus as her Messiah, and there will be in that day a restoration and ingathering of ethnic Israel into the kingdom. They will look upon him for who he is and know him for who he is. And so again, so much packed into this statement of Jesus that we don't have the time to get into, and so I'll resist the temptation and simply get to the point. The question is, what does this mean for us, right? What does this mean for you? Well, it means, beloved, the exact same thing for you as it did for Israel. And that is that either you recognize Jesus as the Christ or you reject him. And understand that those are your only two options. And if you recognize him as the Christ, 
as the Son of God, as the Savior sent into the world to die for your sin, to purchase you, to bring you into his kingdom, then you must receive him and follow him. It is not enough to just be neutral on this. You must receive him by faith and then follow him. In chapter 19, Jesus will say that I have come to seek and to save the lost. That is to say, again, from the depth of his own compassion, he has come to rescue the sinner. Jesus, in other words, is not indifferent toward you. He is not indifferent toward the sinner. Rather, he weeps for those who will not receive him. And he does not delight in the death of the wicked. But let me just end here on this note. Just because Jesus weeps, and just because he does what he does from a place of profound compassion, that does not mean that he will somehow abandon the necessity that he has to bring a just judgment and execution for sin upon the sinner. In this life, if you reject Christ, then the way that his wrath is often worked out is that he just gives you over to the desires of your heart. This is what he does. That which you lust for, that which you long for, that which you're perhaps right now chasing after. So again, so many people think that God doesn't exist or that he's not serious about his word because he permits people to dive headlong into what the Bible calls sin. But that is not the evidence of a passive or a weak or a non-existing God. Rather, that is the very mark, perhaps, of wrath upon their life. It is a passive wrath in which he lets you pursue the wickedness that abides within your own heart. But one day he's coming back and he is bringing with him his judgments. And in that day, which the Bible refers to as the day of the Lord, his passive wrath turns active. And so before he comes, or before you take your final breath and stand before him face to face in the day of your judgment, understand that you dwell right now in this day, in this hour, in a time of profound grace. This is a time in which his patience is holding back that act of wrath. But so that you might have the time to hear the good news of Christ and be forgiven in him. This is the time in which the sinner must come to see their sin. You must come to know your need for deliverance. You must see your wretchedness and understand, therefore, your need to be forgiven. And if you see it, Here's the good news. But if you see it, the good news is that Jesus made it to the cross. Herod didn't get him that day. Made it to the cross. He hung there in your place. Took the penalty of your sin, which is death. Died the death that you should have died. Was buried. Three days later, rose again by the will of the Father and the power of the Spirit, proving that your sin has been paid for. The path of your penalty of your sin was fulfilled, and the work of sin forgiveness finished. Complete. Wrath of the Father satisfied, and all who believe in Him can be forgiven and blessed. This is the gospel. This is the message of Christ. And so the question is, will you receive it or will you reject it? That is the decision that is before you this morning. Christ has made a promise. And so he says from his compassion, because of his commitment to the plan of the Father, that you can come to him. And so he pleads with the sinner, come to him today. For he will not reject the one who knows their need.